uh, uh, Q&A can also uh, uh, hear you, that'd be great. And uh, it'd be great if you could just identify yourself by name, sort of affiliation, and uh, if you want to ask the whole panel a question, that's great, or if you want to direct it to individual speakers, that'd be fine. So. John Nyman, uh, Blue um, What was your assumption of regarding what the uh, firms would do if they uh, didn't there's a big debate as to whether employers would raise workers' wages if they dropped insurance or whether they'd try to keep that amount of money. Our assumption was that if work, employers dropped insurance, they would raise the workers' wages by the amount of their contribution. The employees would then have to pay taxes on that money. So there would be a loss to the employees of getting the money in wages rather than insurance, but there would be no transfer of compensation from the employee to the employer. We didn't think the labor market would continue to work if the employers dropped insurance and started to keep it all. Next question. Carolyn Carlin from the Medical Research Institute. I have a question for Lynn. In all my reading, I had never picked up on the um, asset test going away. And I'm really shocked by that because of the long-term care implications. So how does this Medicaid expansion and the elimination of the long, the asset test affect long-term care coverage? Yeah, so um, long-term care and um, SSI disabled are not included in the changes that were made. So, so it really is non-elderly. So health care and long term care yep. are not distinct. Are, they're now they're very distinct, right. Mm -hmm. I should be in the back. Yeah. Uh, for the program of human rights and health uh, for Ruth. I was uh, thinking a little bit about the fact that they threw out the Commerce Clause and they also threw out the uh, necessary and proper, uh, even though nobody made a big deal about it. I mean, again, for instance, she doesn't make much of that either. But under the taxing power, it seems like there's a considerable expansion. So on the one hand, you can't regulate inactivity under the Commerce Clause, but you can tax it under the taxing power. And I was thinking when I was reading Robert's uh, discussion of it, I thought, well, you know, what else can you tax? And if he gives the example, you could be taxed for not having energy efficient windows. And so if you could be taxed for not having energy efficient windows, couldn't you be taxed for not going into the gym or not buying your broccoli or not buying your personal home defense firearm under the personal home defense firearm law or you know, whatever. <laughs> like, you know, that it seems like there's a huge host of taxable non-activities that are now sort of open. So but they can't well, one can't do policy wise under commerce, it seems like there's a lot of leeway for doing it policy wise under taxing. Just call it tax. No, I, I agree with that and that that um Next question. I had a question for Roger and Jean, which was, <clears throat> I thought one of the goals was to try to get employees that aren't offering insurance to offer insurance. It seems like, from at least your paper, that that ain't going to happen. And, and any thoughts about, is that on intent, or are people shocked by what you found? Or? No, I think so. I mean, so if you're, if you're exactly right. So we know that small employers are the least likely to offer insurance to their workers. And within the ACA, uh, there is a small firm, uh, business, small firm tax credit uh, aimed at low-wage small firms. And essentially, the response has been lousy. Um, very few small firms have taken this up. Um, you know, basically, I think there's a lot of political motivation around this. On the one hand, we want to encourage small firms that are not offering to start offering. So that's why they exempted them from the penalty. But basically, in doing so, they created only stronger mechanism to, to, not, to not move in that direction. Um, they didn't want to be cast as killing jobs, um, which, you know, there's a lot of political discussion around 
how to treat small firms and, and help them along. So, I mean, the, the other thing to remember is that for um, workers in small firms, they might find exchanges to be a, a better option for them, particularly around having a broader set of choices. Most small firms, if they do offer, only offer one plan. Yeah, a, a number of people have argued that the uh, penalty for not buying insurance will give workers an incentive to take up coverage if they're offered but don't have it taken up now, or also go to their employers and collectively say, offer insurance for us. But remember, we're calculating the net advantage of dropping insurance versus, uh, keeping it, excuse me, versus dropping it and sending your workers to the exchange. Both of those strategies avoid the penalty. So the penalty is neutral between those two strategies. Yeah, we have, the, the work we yeah. does not, explicitly deal with the okay. mandate for a second. In the larger picture, if the purpose of the penalty on employers was to keep them offering insurance, it was too small, and, and, the, and the subsidies were too big. Now, some analysts have argued that the purpose should not be to keep employers offering insurance, that we should make the incentives neutral between employer-sponsored insurance and individually purchased insurance. If that's the strategy, the best way to do that would be to design a subsidy that workers could take and spend on either type of insurance. But whoops, I've just described John McCain's 2008 <laughs> proposal. <laughs> yeah, that, that will, I'm interested if Lynn had a comment on, uh, so are the Minnesotas of the world then going to really take advantage and develop these uh, viable exchanges in the Texas and other states in the South are not, and so we're going to see even a greater disparity uh, given what Roger and you just said, if we're forcing uh, or, or really pushing uh, low income workers or workers in small firms to go to the exchange market. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because the goal of the law was to create a universal coverage and have some uniformity <clears throat> across the states, and what's going to happen now, it's going to just you know, increase the disparities across the states, because many of the states will not pursue the Medicaid expansion, um, even if it's gonna cost them money, and because it's so, well, as, as Sarah, I think this is kind of a good juxtaposition, I mean, because of the politics. So it's, um, now Minnesota, as you know, just awarded their $41 million contract for the exchange, so they're moving full speed ahead. You know, our Medicaid expansions, um, in that first chart I showed, we're already above many of those minimums. So we're in, and we have a very large uh, self-insured, large employers who provide good benefits. So we're we're in good shape. Um, but clearly, um, there's probably ten states that are really moving to do both the expansion and the, the exchange. Uh, I have a question for Ruth, and, uh, and this is about what you did talk about, which was the Supreme Court decision around the Medicaid uh, law, part of the law, and. Curious what your thoughts are, um, sort of about the future implications of the decision. So, the Supreme Court decided that this was such a fundamental change to the program that it should, it should alter the way the Medicaid program works in states and opt out of part of it. Um, but, what's your sense of how we think about what going forward constitutes a fundamental change in it? So, these types of programs, and do we have a sense of where that frontier necessarily is at all? Um, what does that mean for future regulatory? Uh, a really, really good question. And um, you know, the, the issue of coercion that's a potential theoretical loss on the Medicaid funding can be so coercive that the states are not going to you know, choose one way or the other. Even though I think most people concluded that the federal government has never made any kind of change. So they basically said, this is coercive. Peter Grado, uh, University of Minnesota. Um, 
on that same point, though, it isn't the transportation funding, wasn't that used for a period of time um, or be withheld for um, blood alcohol, driving wheels, or whatever? It was, actually it was for seatbelts. Um, yeah. And they did fight that case, and that was a case where only 5% In the back. Last yeah, I'm uh, Dan Chapman. I'm the director of employee benefits for the University of Minnesota, so I have a lot of interest on the impact of this on um, us as an employer as well as other large employers. And the, I, I suppose my question is principally to Gene and Roger. Um, to me, it looks like the funding. Uh, that's built into the law as, as it exists is totally inadequate to fund the kind of subsidies that they're proposing to offer. Um, and so it seems to me that the kind of, um, you know, the, the, the measuring work that you did is going to change very rapidly uh, and it's going to become much more uh, the penalty is going to become much heavier for employers to opt out, and I just wondered if you'd yeah, so, address that. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So it's kind of this, uh, it's, it, it's the balance of the penalty versus the subsidies, and it was always kind of weighing up what, how much you need to subsidize individual coverage so people will take it up, and how much you need to penalize employers to keep them, to, to help them maintain or ensure that they maintain offering workers. Again, that's kind of couched in the politics of if you have a plan and you like it, you can keep it. I think you're exactly right, though. Um, you know, they always talk about either pulling levers or dialing policies up and down. And the penalty, and there's a couple ways this could work. One is that the subsidies um, in how they're indexed to inflation, they can make adjustments to that so that over time the value of those subsidies could erode. The other thing they could do is if they see a lot of dropping by employers and there's a lot of pushback, they could propose to modify that uh, that penalty to increase it or tweak it in such a way, or you know perhaps extend it down for firm size distribution to smaller employers. And again, that's a very politically sensitive topic, um, and we'll have to see what what happens. But you know most of the micro simulation models do not find massive dropping. Um, I know Paul Frosten, who's done a lot of work, has indicated there's a herd mentality, though, that if <laughs> firms start to see it happening, they'll just uh, kind of, they'll, they'll all kind of start doing it. So uh, you're exactly right, though. It'll be very interesting to watch what levers have to be pulled going forward. Uh, the, I, I think the, the original bill, if, if, if the Congressional Budget Office got it right, would have been uh, slightly deficit reducing. Um, Rather than speak about the effects on employers, I'd like to mention another aspect of the Supreme Court decision that might influence the cost, and that is the possibility that the Medicaid expansion will migrate into the exchanges where the cost of coverage is going to be higher. Uh, this, the CBO hasn't reported on that yet, but unofficial estimates place that cost at possibly $100 billion. And, and so that's a, that would be a significant expansion in the budget and the deficit. And that's from the additional subsidies that would be required for yes. low-income. Of course, that depends on, on, on what the states do, and that's up in the air. Other questions? Uh, that we could all keep our entire policies. No, and, and, there's, and that's not a trivial promise. I think they really meant it. Uh, and given that there is such a, so much uh, criticism of the individual insurance market, 
I, I think a lot of people were afraid of moving too fast in that direction. I agree. And, and just, to agree, just to emphasize the point about the politics, at least when I was in Washington, the White House is doing polls like every day on messaging. And that's driving a lot of it. David Axelrod is very powerful in driving the agenda and driving decisions. And some decisions like the ESI tax ones that he went right off the table because of those things. So it's power, more very powerful. Um, would the upholding of the mandate then be help with the attachment to my insurance? That is, um, insurers will now see that I have to buy insurance. I'm going to be made to buy insurance. I, I'm going to choose to buy it. I'm going to choose to get it to my employer as long as they give it to me. But wouldn't it be the incentive to the insurance company to make sure that I keep wanting to buy that insurance <coughs> when I or so that so that I'll break the job lock myself and say, you know what, I don't need to stay here to get that. I'm taking it. Yeah, I think a lot of that will depend on um, the relative kind of, uh, uh, administrative loading fees that exist. So basically, the, in large employers, that might be five percent of premium. In the individual market, it might be like twenty percent. So you're basically paying a lot more for the same amount of coverage. So the question is, how close can you get those? Um, and, and I think to the extent that you can put the individual market on par with the employer market, you'll see more people willing to, you know, either self-employed or shift jobs, not worry about that job lock. I have a couple of questioners. Why don't we go to Kirk and then back. Yeah, this is a question for Lynn and maybe Peter. Um, if I could have an income that's 130% of poverty level rather than Hudson, Wisconsin, and Minnesota expands Medicaid uh, to 138, and, and Wisconsin doesn't, should I move across the river? <laughs> yeah, do you see? So my question is, is the, is the benefit of being under the Medicaid provision um, great enough, that is it better than being under the exchange provision in terms of the subsidies? So what would be adverse selection between states that do expand Medicaid versus states that don't? So Minnesota expands theirs, and yeah, say, it kind of with confidence. Right, right. Right. No, I think those are going to be interesting decisions, and, and it depends what the minimum essential benefits that each state will decide upon, which may be, you know, uh, more restrictive than a Medicaid benefit. And so you'd want to compare. You know, there'd be a lot of. But you're right. There could be some decisions made of which benefit you'd want. How much it's going to cost. And in the states that decide not to cover people below 100% poverty, you could see, I think you see a significant migration. I, I, I disagree because, I mean, we've not seen migration now. We have very high levels of coverage. So I think there's little evidence of people. I guess we have a natural experiment to sign on Roger Hill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and in the back. I'm sorry, I, I was really have what is kind of a comment on the employer uh, question, the focus on employer coverage. And I think the reason there's so much focus on it is that for people who work for large employers, uh, we basically have a lot better coverage available to us than is, uh, than is affordable on the individual market. And part of the way in which this law is going to kind of equalize the coverage that's available is to press down on the level of coverage that we can offer here at the university to our employees. It's going to have to get worse. We're going to have to put more out-of-pocket costs onto employees if this thing continues down the road as it's currently written. Dan, are you referring to the Cadillac tax? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the excise tax on high cost health plans beginning in 2018. So it'll be a 40% excise tax rate. That's exactly. I mean, that's a, that's exactly right. That will the incentives for large employers, self self insured employers as well, or self insured businesses as well, will be. Um, you know, I think I think that you know that's also a very controversial provision. Again, the politics are going to be interesting to watch to see if this actually happens in 2018. Dan, I, 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 uh, I may be channeling Brian Dowd here, but, but I, I'm a little bit hopeful. The, the, 
Cadillac tax is going to leave so little room for maneuvering to get underneath those limits. You know, Fred Morrison has described it as a box yeah. that's closed off on all sides. That may finally give us an opportunity to redesign our health plan so that we start uh, charging people more for stuff that doesn't work and maybe not covering things that we shouldn't be covering. <laughs> maybe to get inside the box, we would have a more cost-effective health insurance plan. That would be lovely. Uh, Jim Hart, Public Health Practice. As you know, in Minnesota, there's a lot of wind behind the accountable care organization concept. Uh, I guess the question I would ask is, is there enough in the federal law to really incent that, or is that just happening because that's the way Minnesota's system is evolving, or however else you want to look at that. But as you know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, wind there. Uh, I don't know the answer to the wind speed, but uh, I'm kind of hoping for a quiet or or <laughs> or, or, or stall. Uh, uh, I've just done some research with uh, with some of my colleagues looking at Medicare Advantage plans that are sponsored by provider organizations like hospital systems. And we find that these uh, MA plans uh, charge uh, higher prices than the unaffiliated plans. So I, I'm not a big fan of vertical integration. When, when you were talking about Medicaid expanding, right now, at least in the state of Minnesota, Medicaid and K-12 represent about 75 to 80% of the state's budget. That expands. Are we having political push from the non-K-12, non-social services um, departments pushing um, one way or another so that they don't lose their footing in their slice of the pie? Well, that's a good question. So Medicaid is, Medicaid is about 25%. So, so the big state centers are Medicaid, transportation, and K through 12. So it kind of depends, like when the bridge fell, transportation was off the table for cuts. <laughs> And so Medicaid was was squeezed a little bit. It, so those are the three big players, and um, those three are always fighting for a share of the pie. I mean, I don't know. I don't see it this year as being any different. Well, it, and it wasn't necessarily goals, but say like you did higher education. The Minnesota only has one basic higher education. I mean, if you looked at the sizes that you compared to. The entire minuscule yep. is it's very skewed. Yep. That. And most, you know, most states are still coming out of the recession. They don't have a lot of budget. We don't have a lot of, we don't have any rainy day funds. And so every year it just becomes, you know, what's the revenue? How much do we have? And, you know, trying to balance all those objectives. Sue so, McLernan, um, U of M. I was just going to kind of follow on the ACOs with over 100 plus ACOs and frankly the fear all the consolidation is happening significantly on the provider side of the market, intended or unintended, vertically and horizontally across the U.S. We're, we're already kind of more there than most places, but I think that's the sleeper in this whole policy concern. Well, on the Medicaid side, a lot of the big private plans have bought up the Medicaid managed care plans because when California let their contract for Medicaid managed care, you already represent, yeah, you already have to be operating a managed care plan. So the big plans figured if there's going to be this huge Medicaid expansion, I need to be in that market. So now, now that this, you know, it's optional, it's, a, it's just a very interesting dynamic, yeah. it's both at the private sector and this, you know, trying to figure out what, where the public sector is going to go. We're, we're, I, th that's I think that that's a topic for, for, for our next uh, session. <laughs> yeah. if, if affordable care is, is going to interact with ongoing changes in the organization of the delivery system, they are really going to be profound. Lynn mentioned the purchase of, of uh, Medicaid plans uh, by private companies. Uh, there's going to be continued migration to Medicaid yep. managed care and for the duals. There, there, will, there will be um, big changes in the Medicare mm -hmm. Advantage market, which could p potentially become the market of last resort for people who want to get away from rationing in the fee-for-service sector. 